Good morning and welcome to the 18th meeting of the committee in 2019. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any, any members using electronic devices to access committee papers during the meeting should ensure that they're switched to silent. We have received um, apologies from Tavish Scott, MSP. Uh, the first item on our agenda is an evidence session with two panels of witnesses as part of the committee's arts funding inquiry and I'd like to welcome our first panel of witnesses, Fiona Campbell who's the convener of the Traditional Music and Song Association of Scotland, Jude Henderson the director of the Federation of Scottish Theatre and Irene Kernan, Director of Craft Scotland. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, as you'll uh, be aware, um, uh, having answered um, our uh, call for evidence, um, this is a wide-ranging inquiry into arts funding and it follows on from the committee's uh, short inquiry last year into the issues that arose as a result of um, difficulties around the uh, RFO uh, funding awards uh, at the beginning of last year. Uh, so we're, we're having a look at um, the way that the arts generally are funded in Scotland uh, and whether we could do it better and particularly the tensions between uh, larger organisations um, uh, and individual artists and smaller organisations. Um, perhaps, you know, like um, in, in terms of funding as a whole, um, what do you think that needs to be done in order to make funding sustainable and uh, what adjustments would you make uh, to improve matters? I don't know who wants to go first. Well, that's a, clearly a very <laughs> straightforward question. Um, I think... The first thing to say is that um, in my sector, there is a great deal of collaboration between artists and larger institutions. We had a members meeting in Aberdeen yesterday where members reiterated their sense that uh, stable ongoing concerns in, uh, as part of a cultural infrastructure is actually a good thing for artists because it provides them with um, supportive, engaged, uh, informed and mentoring communities where they can make their work collaboratively as all the work in our sector does. There is definitely an issue around what is our cultural infrastructure and how collectively we decide what that cultural infrastructure is and how far beyond buildings it goes. Uh, members have discussed the potential for looking at entitlements to culture. What should people expect in any particular geographical area that they should have ready access to? And that's absolutely a conversation that our members are keen to engage with in a wider conversation around what does the cultural infrastructure for Scotland look like? And I think it's also important to say that that would never be set in stone, um, that that would be an ongoing conversation about what at any one time a cultural infrastructure for Scotland would look like. Anyone else want to? Fiora? Yeah. Um, I, I think going on from that, I think that important question about what is infrastructure um, and what does it consist of, um, and I like the not just set in stone, um, because it does go beyond stone. One of the um, other, there's other infrastructures on a physical level that actually also have a great bearing on cultural activity in Scotland. And one of them is the travel and, and transport infrastructure. Um, one of the main barriers that a lot of people have done through the research I was doing, particularly when working with Voluntary Arts Scotland, right. was how do we get places? How do we get there? For example, people wanted to go to Livingston to Howden Park Centre, but the last bus back to Linlithgow um, would actually leave about 7.30pm. Uh, 7 so there was no way they could actually engage in the evening activities in that respect if they had to rely on public transport. Um, in fact, I've often said that if you can get the transport right, you probably get most of the you know, attendance at cultural activities, right? Um, the other issue is digital infrastructure, which we all know in certain areas of Scotland is still lacking, or you know, people aren't as connected as they would like to be, and sometimes the strangest places aren't connected quite near to urban areas that you would think would have all the digital fibre and whatever broadband you needed um, going. And I uh, you know, applaud the looking at satellites and the other ways that we can actually get. Um, connectivity because also that will play in for not just people making a living online or using it to sell things but also um, being able to connect with um, you know town twinning associations being able to talk 
you know, by email and all the things you can now do that you used to have to wait days for the post to turn up. Um, you can now do a lot more things and there's a lot more connectivity that we could do to bring more culture to Scotland and more culture out of Scotland. Um, and from the traditional arts point of view, I think what's interesting, a lot of people feel that, often see the word traditional and go, oh, they must be very far behind on things. And um, it, it, we're not, actually. I find that the traditional arts and a lot of the tradition bearers, for example, are often the first people to be the early adopters of um, cyber and digital work. Um, I know Sheena Wellington's a very you know, sort of active person on her social media. So it's just about looking at some of those other infrastructures that inform it, and also importantly, the people that make those infrastructures relevant, because without thinking about the people. Thank you. Did you want to come in, Irene? <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, uh, I would add, um, I would agree with both of those um, points, but for um, just speaking from the craft sector, um, craft has a problem with visibility and part of that is indeed infrastructure. There's a, a lack of security around um, studio spaces and studio buildings. Um, although there is an excellent national network of production facilities, which um, isn't as well known as it should be, um, there it has been a lack of investment in those as well. And I think the one of the features of craft is the level of innovation that comes through. Um, in terms of the material skills and knowledge and how that transfers across different <coughs> sectors and then adds value um, in those terms in maybe academia, business, health, science. Um, so I think um, investment in the sort of infrastructure that will encourage that innovation would be badly needed. In terms of the, the way that um, organisations are directly funded either by the Scottish Government or Creative Scotland, uh, there are obviously some organisations that are con deemed too important to fail. Um, the national performing companies obviously are, are, are centrally uh, directly funded from Scottish Government. Uh, but then you've got the RFO funding process where you have... Um, you have organisations uh, such as uh, the Federation of Scottish Theatre competing for funds against individual theatre companies and individual artists. Um, that was the source of some tension and, and debate um, during our inquiry last year. Um, do you think we've got that quite right in terms of uh, the way that we fund particularly organisations that um, are supporting uh, the sector or are considered too big to fail, so to speak? Yes, um, I think no is the short answer to that. Um, again, the discussion that we had yesterday was around, it was around people and honesty. It was around saying if there are organisations that are deemed to be too important to a community, that, um, and that's not just even around culture actually, there are some of our members who are massively important in social and economic terms as players in their local communities. Um, so there, there's a real issue around making sure that you don't remove that, um, that vital infrastructure. Organisations such as ourselves are part of that infrastructure. The Federation of Scot Scottish Theatre has been around for 43 years. Um, and we offer support to our members in a variety of ways. I think we feed, it plays back into that conversation about what is the cultural infrastructure um, and how do we work out what that does. Members um, at our meeting yesterday talked about the need for a multi-stage funding process. Um, I think there's a, there's a primary issue when you're talking about arts funding in the round, that all of the time spent getting funding from the arts funder is time that could have been spent on looking at other trusts and foundations or other collaborative or individual approaches to getting funding. So people mentioned, for example, Foundation Scotland as a good model of an organisation where you can have a 20 minute phone call to determine whether or not they're interested in funding what you have to offer. Uh, and then you get what's essentially a champion within that organisation who takes you through the next stages. Um, and these are felt to be respectful and human processes that take account of um, how people are and how they work and that don't try and fit everyone into a one-size-fits-all approach. I think the other thing to say is that the three-year regular funding cliff edge puts the entire sector in a state of 
really, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say emergency. Every three years, everyone in the sector doesn't know if they're going to have a job after the next funding announcement. And it is as stark as that. We have lost members because of the last funding round where funding was withdrawn. And members have asked me to say um, that the human impact of receiving an email, which means you've lost your job, is really not a respectful way to treat people. Um, in terms of that multi-stage, multi-year, annual rolling, you know, some people going for one year of funding, some people getting two years funding, some people basically being an assumption of five to ten years funding, that provides a stable platform for those larger institutions to, to genuinely start getting the investment that they need to make them sustainable for the future. Three years is not long enough for my industry. People are already programming beyond their funded allocations. Um, so an assumption of some level of core stability, however we decide to whom that goes, is something that we really need to have a conversation about. Um, and those are some of the key points that people raised around multi-stage, multi-year and human and respectful approaches within that. I actually, I don't know if we're going in a particular order, but um, I, the thing about the applications, um, as a volunteer writing funding applications, my job, you know, I'm not being paid for that side of things. Um, my life could be a lot better <laughs> and doing a lot more arts activity, but I've chosen to make sure that we can support the traditional arts in Scotland, which I see is so key to the identity of this um, country. And you might think, why is a New Zealander saying that? Um, because I actually am of the diaspora, and I know that if you don't nurture particularly the traditional arts of Scotland at its root, and that's a form of infrastructure as well. Um, the leaves and the flowers and all the blossoming of it that we... Actually, a lot of people are very proud of their Scottish roots, sometimes more tenuous than others, but um, they... They're very proud of that, but also Scotland is very proud of how we've been able to contribute to the world, mostly positively, but I mean, I'm aware there's some issues around how we've contributed. Um, but the idea that people can come back and see where they come from is really important. And I know people have often sort of said, oh, it's all about whiskey and tartan and shortbread. Um, I think that view is actually the more, the outdated view, rather than, I mean, whiskey is evolving Tartan is evolving and shortbread's evolving, so I think people are actually got an outdated view. Sorry, that's a personal bugbear of mine. Um, but um, from the traditional arts point of view, um, we've got to be aware that there's an element of infrastructure in there as well from the language. I mean, we've got two very strong languages besides the English aspect of um, culture, which is the Scots and Gaelic. And um, we're talking about key organisations. The TMSA Keith branch run the Keith Festival, which has been going for over 30 years now. And it's one of the key economic institutions of that area. It's also one of the major reasons Keith was um, produced, um, given the title of Scots Toon. Um, so I think it's just a, an important thing that recognising that maybe the TMSA doesn't get regular funding. Um, Keith Branch fortunately gets a bit of local funding and support from its local community, but it's partly because it's recognised that it's a very key part of that economic activity. Um, so I'm just aware that it's difficult to sometimes ascertain what is of national importance, because I would say something like the Keith Festival is of national importance, but it's not a national organisation, but it's a branch run by a branch of a national organisation. So it's it's about working out what level of importance and significance to a local community, as well as also the national significance as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I suppose from the um, craft sector, um, we are a national agency, but we are supporting um, a sector that is largely made up of sole traders um, with um, small businesses. Um, so our role is to enable them to develop their careers and their business um, uh, in various ways. So I think the fact that we can work to um, support makers very directly um, in ways that they wouldn't be able to do themselves. Um, I'm just thinking of um, a show that we organise in London, for example. Um, so we organise all the logistics for the show. Um, the makers, uh, all, all that work is done for the makers. We promote them. 
and it's a it's very much about selling work and raising their profile so um, for an individual maker that would take an enormous amount of investment in terms of time and resources um, which they probably wouldn't be able to manage themselves working at the scale they do so I think there are um, examples where you can see where a national agency adds real benefit to individual artists thank you very much can I just make another point? Sorry, I knew there was something else. Um, it's very important to also understand that a lot of these network organisations were set up by individual artists or on the basis of them wanting to join together or smaller organisations wanting to come together to have either a national voice or be able to share concerns and get peer support. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to remember um, when we're looking at that sort of... The problem is the way the system works at the moment is it is a versus rather than an and. So it's sort of like an or. And so I think it's about how do we make it more of an and type system and people understand where the ecology is and maybe some artists aren't getting the best use out of their networks, possibly. So that's kind of... Thank you very much. I'm going to pass on to Claire Baker now, but can I ask um, members on, and the panel to keep uh, questions and answers as succinct as possible because we have two panels today so we've just got until 10 past 10 and I'm anxious to make sure that every member gets to ask uh, their questions. Thank you, Claire. Um, thank you, convener. As the convener said, the inquiry came out of the, um, the consideration we had last year over Creative Scotland's funding and I suppose the question I wanted to ask was whether we should be looking at the cake. Is it how we cut the cake? Or is it about increasing the size of the cake? And the submission we heard from Jude Henderson does describe a real terms cut of 12.5% from government and a predicted 25% cut over the next 10 years. And the submission from Fiona did talk about uh, proposals that we try and increase the amount overall. Um, so does the panel want to comment on that issue? And if it is about how we increase the size of the cake, how do we make the case for that and how do we do that? Well, um, I think we've, a lot of us have been making that case for a large number of years. Um, it's always been important that I think it's all, a, in the end, the end, it's a priority. And to understand that what culture and creativity and all the work that goes around that brings to the, um, the country from both a social as well as also economic value and understanding that what 1% investment of the Scottish budget would actually do, it would release a lot more activity, it would enable a lot more artists to make a career to stay in this country, to better support it with its, their creativity. And it's about understanding, so it's just a question of priorities in the end when it comes to budget setting from the government point of view. It's also about the public do support, um, you know, if you look at the cultural accounts um, um, statistics. I should have looked at it before I came, but um, you know, it is a very high support. And also the Scottish Government Household Survey finds this high support for arts and activity. So I don't think people would really grudge it. But I mean, the issue is about how it fits within the other funding infrastructure, for example, the lottery. Um, unfortunately, it's not a devolved area yet. Um, but it's the kind of thing that I, I read recently that £39 million was spent by Camelot on advertising the National Lottery. The reason why they have to advertise so much now is because of deregulation. But that, think of what that kind of money could have done in the arts sector. Um, for example, only half a million of pound goes to Awards for All. Imagine what £39 million could do. Just, just a point. I would obviously always advocate for more money going into the culture budget. Um, I think that we give enormously good value for enormously small amounts of money, if I can say enormously small. Um, so if you look at what we already deliver on not very much, imagine what we could deliver with not very much more. So that would always be a primary objective for me. However, I do think there is scope to use what we have better to enable us to drive more investment into the sector. I was going to ask if the cultural strategy which has been um, developed, if you think that will uh, help make the case, do you, you understand the cultural sector it, strategy, is it about increasing resources or, or is it about expressing value? Do you have a clear understanding of what it's trying to achieve? I, suppose? I think at the moment the, the draft that came out made the case for um, understanding the different aspects of culture. I think it's not yet clear what the strategy will look like in terms of driving investment in culture and understanding culture's impact on other bits of the investment portfolio.
And that's, I suppose maybe Irene wants to come in, because I, I, I attached to that is we've heard some evidence that we all know the value of arts to health budgets, to education budgets, but there doesn't seem to be much sharing of budgets. Do any of you have experience of um, receiving funding from other areas rather than just, significant, rather than just cultural budgets? Um, well, we um, have worked with um, NHS Scotland um, on small projects, which clearly deliver a lot of value. Um, and it is a bit frustrating. Um, I think the difficult thing for arts is we're all struggling to manage and maintain, and standstill funding means cuts, which means you struggle even more. And the message that we're getting is that we all need to be more sustainable and bring in more income from other sources. But that's very hard when you're so overstretched. So um, I think... Um, I think there needs to be a lot more connectivity across different sectors because there's so much evidence of the value that the arts brings to um, almost every sector of society. We have actual <laughs> academic and uh, scientific research to show this. So I think those messages need to be um, made articulated much more clearly and on a very regular basis um, if we're to open up other funding sources. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Alexander. Thank you, uh, convener. Can I talk about some of the local authority side of things? So if funding arts at local authority level, uh, does that fit into a wider strategy at national level? And if not, should that be the case? And how would that work? Well, I think local authority funding is essential. Um, and you can see the impact that there's been by having that removed or eroded over the last few years. Um, I think local authorities can work very closely with their communities and target funding um, in response to need or opportunity um, in a way that maybe the national funder isn't always able to do. Um, I think you, I know in Ireland they've just started an interesting um, model now um, compelling the local authorities to commit arts funding. Um, within their budgets. So I think something like that would have to happen. But I think also um, a very rigorous um, review system would be required as well to ensure um, quality and sustainability of the actual activity that it's funding. Yes, I think there is um, obviously local democratic processes are local democratic processes and national democratic processes are national democratic processes. I do think there is value, and this is where the culture strategy may provide an opportunity in giving us a framework where people can interpret that at local level in the way that suits their local needs. Um, I was going to say that I'd commend all the local authorities that are still able to produce some form of cultural budget and able to particularly offer maybe small grants um, out to small organisations locally because, again, that close relationship, as mentioned before, but also being able to sustain a certain element of cultural venues because without places to meet, um, it becomes very difficult. Um, thankfully, there are places that they've looked at community asset exchanges and um, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, from a traditional arts point of view, where a lot of it's about place, it's really important that the local authority is able to value its heritage as well. And those authorities that have given a priority and continue to give that priority. They have seen some real expansion in the culture sector across their own uh, area, uh, and that has been because they have prioritised uh, that that's what they believe should take place. And there has been <coughs> collaboration between organisations, yourselves and them, uh, to try and make that happen. But why should that not be the case all over? Postcode lottery, maybe, <laughs> is the term. Um, I, th I think the issue is about making the case locally, um, values and, again, priorities of each council, how they're dealing with their you know, cuts or how they see they're best able to deal with those things. Um, I feel that those who have actually completely cut their budgets are probably experiencing a poorer quality of life um, in general and will be affecting other services. But, again, it's that holistic approach to looking at how, if people are happy, they tend to use the health service less, etc. It's, it's just a case in point. And it shouldn't be about that you instrumentally, they have to do the arts. Mm -hmm. It's actually, it's about how it should be part of people's lives makes a lot of difference because it's just, it builds resilience, etc. Okay, thank you. 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 Th
And, and some local authorities have, have done the route of going down the trust route to try and support, uh, because that does give an arm's length uh, organisation, but, but that in itself has caused some difficulties too for some of them as to how they maintain and sustain that. So once again, what, what would your view be to try and ensure that we have that equilibrium between local and national level? No, I, I think it's a strategic framework that recognises culture's value at the heart and allows people to implement that locally. We now have a national outcome in, for culture in the performance framework, which we warmly welcome. Um, the question, as always, is how will that be interpreted on the ground? Um, and that's something that we've been working closely with Culture Counts, the umbrella body of all Scotland's culture um, organisations, to try and make sure that we get the measurement of that so that people can really see how that's working at local level. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, thank you, Annabel. Uh, thank you, Vina. Good morning. Um, sticking with the issue of funding uh, for the moment, um, I noted with interest in the submission from uh, uh, Jude Henderson on behalf of the Federation of Scottish Theatre, uh, an interesting uh, uh, issue which was on the topic of collaborative funding uh, approaches and specifically uh, the City of Edinburgh Place partnership uh, it was cited. So this involves funds from the Scottish Government and from the local authority, which have to be matched by new private sponsorship. So I, I wonder if we could hear a wee bit more about that and why you think that, in some circumstances, could perhaps be a, a useful way forward, taking into account that the cake, as Claire Baker has said, is the cake, uh, more or less, uh, and we need to look at innovative ways of increasing the cake. Yes, I think that's a good example of where all funding, all collaborative funding comes from, which is all the partners articulating really clearly what they bring and what they can get uh, and where the mutual benefit lies in the middle of that. Um, uh, one of our members, um, Pitt Lockery Festival Theatre, has secured um, a significant amount of funding through the, uh, place, through the, the city deal, the Tayside um, city deal. Um, and that is really clearly about what them articulating what they can offer that aligns with the strategic objectives of the local authority. Um, and again, when that comes to external funders, we know that uh, trusts and foundations will have specific groups of people that they want to target, specific communities that they're looking to support. Um, and it's always about acting with the integrity of the art at the heart and the quality of the art being absolutely um, the, the most important thing. And then looking at the, the broader impacts and the broader strategic priorities for that arts organisation and where those naturally align with the priorities for local authorities or other trusts and funders. And if everybody's really clear that the best quality work that has the, the most impact is what they're looking at, it makes it relatively straightforward or, or less difficult perhaps to identify where they are aligned um, and then I, I believe that that drives greater benefit for everyone. Everybody puts a bit in and everybody gets out of it what they need. Thank you for that. Is, 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 as far as you are aware, is the City of Edinburgh Place Partnership, is that unique in Scotland or do other uh, local authorities uh, adopt similar? Uh, I'm not sure Creative Scotland has got a, um, a Place Partnership strategy and I know that they have not been sufficiently resourced to deliver that across all the local authorities in Scotland. Um, I believe there is also in Ireland uh, a match funding approach coming in where um, central government offers funding to local authorities on condition that it's matched and that may be a route that the committee might look to explore. Yes, I mean in the regard to the City of Edinburgh Place Partnership it seems that a, a, a role is there for private sponsorship and I just wonder uh, in terms of, of the general position, whether you feel that um, that is an, an area that has really been, um, I don't want to use the word exploited, that perhaps is not the best word, but has been looked into uh, 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 seriously as a, as a possible source of significant funding, because it seems to me that, um, that it, you know, if you don't ask in life, you don't get. And it seems to me that that could be an area of activity if there was more attention focused on it by all players that uh, could be uh, ripe uh, with opportunity? I think it could. I think there's an issue of capacity and resource in the sector. When you've taken a pound out of every four away in the last 10 years, it means that you're operating at very, very slim margins. Um, so we would welcome support for collaborative approaches to, um, to looking at, at driving that kind of additional income generation. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, when national budgets are cut from Westminster mm -hmm. by some two billion over ten years, it has knock-on consequences. Uh, and I think yeah, the cabinet secretary did very well indeed to <coughs> protect uh, culture funding as the best she could. Yes. I was just going to raise that there are other organisations that maybe not seen as cultural organisations from the offset um, is the development trusts um, uh, quite a number of them operate in a place format um, because they're usually based around a particular island or you know geographic area and I'm just aware in Edinburgh um, the Edinburgh Old Town Development Trust um, which I'm involved with a bit um, has worked with the city council and um, the artisan developers who are a private sector company around the whole Carlton area um, development, um, sorry, Canongate area, that they've got a community centre which is actually going to have a lot of the cultural activities because that's a demand of the local area. Um, so there's just that point that there are other examples of something similar collaborative way, bringing in private uh, sponsorship here and there um, that may not look immediately like a cultural um, venue, but uh, they, they are. So just a thought to look at that as well. The Foundation Scotland that Jude referenced earlier is a really interesting organisation because they um, have they bring in philanthropic uh, d money and donations and business um, money as well, private funding, um, and their their team are experts in managing those relationships um, and in nurturing donors and funders. Um, and so, and they are also a very open organisation and very good at matching up um, activity and organisations with funders. And I think having that sort of expertise held within one organisation like that um, would be an interesting thing to look at for the arts as well. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Suggestion. Okay. Kenneth. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, uh, panel. Um, uh, West Kilbride is Scotland's craft town, uh, uh, as you'll be aware. But I'm just wondering how many other people in Scotland are aware of that. And until this morning, I didn't know there was a, you know, a, a, about the Keith Festival. And uh, less than two weeks ago, we had the Anne Folk Festival, and I promoted it on my Facebook, and I had the, the organisers get back to me saying thanks. That's helped to sell additional tickets. The point I'm making is that there are so many things that are actually happening in Scotland which people would be interested in if they knew about. Is there, is there a way in which we collectively, because rather than organisations with very, very small budgets, trying to promote by social media, whatever, uh, th their own events or, or, or what, what they're doing, is there some way we can coordinate that better to ensure that people who may wish to uh, attend or participate um, are more able to do so because awareness is raised? Um, well, uh, I don't know if you're aware of the newly launched SCAN campaign, the Scottish Contemporary Arts Network, and that is very much focused on raising profile of um, any arts activity across Scotland. Um, and SCAN will be approaching you all about um, how you might raise awareness within your local constituencies. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a really valid point. I mean, um, there's, as you know, we've been saying, organizations and um, individuals are really stretched in just delivering their work um, and so the promotional activity often falls to the side so um, I think again um, yeah I suppose one of our roles very much is promoting the sector the work of the individuals within it the successes of the craft sector um, and uh, so, so we do invest some resource in that, but it's still it's still not enough. So I think um, those sorts of campaigns, like the scan one, where the value of activity. So, so, so before others come in, can I just come back mm. on that and say, do you feel perhaps that there should be a kind of an all Scotland kind of website or whatever, where every organisation or activity could be logged, if you like, as soon as they're organised. So if I decided. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to be going up to Nairn or something in July and all that. I wonder what's going to be happening up there or whatever, and I can go in and look at that. Or I might say, well, actually, I'm interested in something, but I don't really know what's actually happening the other way around, you know. And then I could maybe find, go go to a place where it is, or if there's specifics in terms of crafts or whatever, theatrical productions. Do you think there's a, some, you know, that there's a, we could perhaps do something much more? Well, 
Yeah, there, there are lots I, of mapping. I feel, I feel like I should be doing an, an advert yeah, for yeah. the TMSA. We actually <laughs> produce the TMSA event calendar, which isn't just about the TMSA events. There's about 60 to, seven organ 60 to 70 organisations who actually advertise their local folk festival events, um, services, etc. through this. And this is published um, each year around Celtic Connections. 50,000 copies are distributed, about 20,000, uh, sorry, 30,000 around Scotland for tourists to pick up, as well as also local people and another 20,000 recently in the last couple of years has been spread down beyond the south the south border um, to over to Ireland and into Wales. Um, we'd like to go further, but um, we actually used to get funding for this under regular funding of uh, the Scottish Arts Council, um, but now we have to make it pay for itself, so people have to contribute something in, which means some people have chosen not to take part in it. Um, but that's that's been going for 20 years. Um, it started off as an initiative between the TMSA and the then Scottish Tourist Board. Um, we now still do work with Visit Scotland on elements of that. Um and we did a marketing process that was able to take us out beyond Scotland with it. So we're trying our best. You ideally would have got one of these all <laughs> given in, because um, we gave in a whole part of each and MSP. Um, so it's just that aware that there is things like that. We also have developed an interactive music map of Scotland, which if people are, and again, in relationship with Visit Scotland, um, if people are going to Nairn, they theoretically can click on that area and have a look and see what's happening locally. We've got a to a certain point with that. We need more resources to continue building it and uh, side of things but we are already trying to do that for the traditional arts side of things okay so. i think it'd be good if it could be done across all genres of the arts if possible but uh, and then you would get even more people uh, into it just just one final question if i can actually convene and that's um, about the balance of arts funding uh, I, I went to see the magic flute a couple of weeks ago magnificent it was and i understand the conveners also seen it and possibly other members of the committee and uh, i was writing a, a wee article for the Anne voice about uh, scottish opera and it, you know it's going out to uh, communities some 34 communities uh, later this year uh, and i noticed they get eight million pounds government funding i mean which is a lot of money um you know for the high for that one particular um area of the high arts do you feel that the balance of funding is right in scotland i mean obviously you believe, believe there should be more arts funding but do you think the balance is quite right as it is at the moment I think it could be better definitely for certain areas that are not so well funded. Um, I think some of the areas, for example, if you're going back to the language side of things, I think if Scots language had a similar level of funding to what Gaelic currently gets, that would help bring that up to um, a better prominence um, and support. Um, and yeah, I would, I would say that there's definitely more, but I think I would rather grow the pie than cut it more, mm -hmm. because I think all of these have a valid um, way to make sure our culture is enriched, but I think we need to actually put more money in ultimately, um, and I don't think we should actually be continuing on the sort of why cut it thinner. I think we should actually definitely make a case to grow the pie. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say that um, Scottish Opera obviously are coming out to communities all over Scotland, and that's not a cheap thing to do. Um, so cutting that funding would inevitably have an impact on their ability to take that work beyond the central belt. Um, so that would be another thing to think about in terms of that balance. Well, I was just, I was just playing devil's advocate there because I was thinking, you know, it, obviously, uh, the, it, if the pie is not going to be grown, and I don't know that whether it will over the next few years, who, who can know with the uncertainties ahead? I was just wondering how you felt we could do um, possibly better with the resources that we have. Thank you, Camille. Thank you. Just to pick up, I think uh, I think Mr. Gibson raises a raises an important point there uh, in terms of obviously Scottish opera is directly funded. Um, in terms of the traditional arts, do you think there is more that we could do to elevate the traditional arts uh, to the same level in terms I, of... I'd, I'd always be pleased to see more support going in there because there's things that are undone and could be done better um, if there was more money. But I'm, 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 I still feel that I think we should be pushing for more pie than slicing it more because... I also have an. Op I come from a very diverse musical and theatre background, and so I feel that you know there is a role for opera. It might be that maybe Scottish opera isn't always the only one that needs to be delivering it. So it is an issue there, but it's about how do we offer the full range of activity? Because I think if we start saying 
we can only have this as opposed to everything else. Yeah. It means I, I, that people I don't think Mr. Gibson was saying that. Yeah. I, I think he was I think he was just saying, you know, like you know, like have you done a kind of a parity in terms of like the, the art forms that you represent? Do you think that they should be more? We definitely have had um, it, our, one of our directors from quite a while ago did do a comparison of the funding at the time. We haven't necessarily updated that. Uh, we don't necessarily have the capacity to do it. But I think that you will find that, yes, we could do with more money in the traditional arts and it could be elevated more and it could be um, supported more and enthused more because a lot of people sort of they may have been forced to do Scottish country dancing at some point in their lives and they sort of then disparage it. And But it's an important way that people learn to move. Yeah. Yeah. The whole point of my, what I was really asking was the first paragraph, uh, Fiona, of your own submission says, the budget allocated for public investment in the arts, especially for the government's main cultural agency, is proportionately far below what cultural activities impact on the economy and well-being of the country. So when I was raising that issue, it was just to see that for the money that is available and will always be short of money, is this the best way in, to ensure the boost to the economy and the well-being of the country, you know, eight million in this specific organisation, as opposed to perhaps what would eight million extra do for your own organisation, for example. So all I'm trying to say is, are we getting the right balance? Uh, are we getting the best bang for our buck in terms of public money, in terms of promoting the arts and stimulating the arts generally across Scotland? That was really the kind of question I was trying to ask. I wasn't particularly picking on a sector which I'm not yeah. actually very fond of personally, yeah. but I just I'm just trying to put that out there because we're we're looking we we know that funding is always going to be an issue. So it's just to see how we can optimise it. I'd agree with you there. Um I mean I think the other point I made in the paper is about ensuring that the volunteer investment, mm -hmm. because remember a lot of people put their own money in, so you're talking about private investment earlier. Um is is a help to be supported and that can be anything from making sure that cultural venues stay there so they can continue doing their activity without huge amounts of expense um through to basically every so often people want to try a development take a little bit of a risk do something a bit different from what they've done but they may not find it very easy to mm -hmm. articulate the case or there's not really the resources available locally from a local authority or creative scotland's funding it's either you've got to put in a larger bid or there's not really a small pot of funding like that's where the tusker a small traditional arts fund is working really well because it's sort of that good level to try something out um, but that doesn't necessarily exist in some of the other sectors and the only reason that small grants funding exists is because Faith and the Gale have been constantly putting a you know, taking the um, the the effort to adv um, uh, approach um, Creative Scotland to do it um, because the original concept was there but we needed someone to lead on it so and they had the infrastructure to be able to support it. Thanks. So, mm. I, I, guess, I guess, you know, like there's an understanding that we have a national opera company, and I think everybody understands why you have a national opera company in the same way as you would have a national theatre or orchestra, ballet company. But traditional arts, we don't have a national company for. We don't have a national youth company either that's directly funded, which is, I know, has been in some of your submissions and is maybe a, a theme as well of our inquiry. It's different opinions about whether we should have a national performing arts company that's traditional arts based because then what, what's its main purpose and things like that. There are some people who definitely advocate it, other people who feel that we be, should be better promoting what people currently already produce. For example, the idea of having a travel fund for artists to go beyond the borders of Scotland with what we're doing new and exciting and also you know, supporting the tradition in Scotland as well as also around the country itself. So it's, it's, it's about um, thinking, I think that's the two main camps, shall we say, about it. Because then, then you could be arguing that you might end up codifying what traditional arts is as opposed to allowing it to breathe and develop, which is actually one reason why it's still alive in Scotland. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Stuart McMillan. Um, thank you, uh, convener. Um, just a, a couple of questions, uh, first of all, regarding the funding. Um, one of the suggestions uh, that has came up to the committee has been something called a percentage uh, for arts. And uh, in terms of if there's any, you know, any type of development taking place in the local authority area, um, then a particular percentage should be allocated towards arts. Is that something that you, you would agree with in terms of, kind of growing the pie as compared to dividing the pie further? Um, it's, it's already a principle that operates from in a general purpose point of view. Um, for example, that's where I mentioned um, a community or cultural centre being developed by 
in Edinburgh. Um, but I would I would always advocate that's a good idea because again it's that especially developers understanding that you need to create a community when you're creating the housing infrastructure. Um, there's been issues around people building lots of houses, but there's no infrastructure in there or from a cultural point of view or even a community point of view. You might have the odd playground, but there's, you know, they're not necessarily looking at shops. They're expecting people to drive places and things like that. So, um, yeah, I would say that that would be a good way to look at it. That's one option. Yes, I think if it's, if it's about trying to increase the pie, then that's absolutely to be welcomed. I think we do warmly welcome the fact that culture has been protected. Um, as against, the, as the evidence says, there's been an overall cut um, that is much bigger than, than the one that has actually been delivered through the culture budget. Um, at local authority level, those, pro those pressures are there as well. Um, so anything that helps us to increase the size of the pie by placing culture at the heart of decision making such that people are always thinking about culture as a core part of the decisions that they make rather than some sort of add-on or something that you, you, you get as a luxury, if you like, rather than as a necessity. Um, I often think, you know, what would the world be like if we didn't have arts and culture? And immediately everyone can picture that and see how, um, what a grey place it would be. So it's about how we support decision makers to put culture at the heart of that decision making um, when they're thinking about decisions that affect their places and their, their people and their communities. Um, oh, I would agree with that and I think the investment would be welcome but I would also think that artists should be involved in decision making and planning stages for development um, across communities as well. They bring immense value at that stage so as well as it being just um, a, a sort of income in terms of investment I think if artists were also included in planning and um, development, that would be valuable. Okay. Um, Fiona, in your submission, uh, you state that leaving the EU has other challenges uh, funding-wise, such as the loss of access to the collective cultural funding, which is usually proportionally greater in return than the proportion of the funding the UK contributes. Yeah. Uh, can you uh, elaborate on that, please? I understand from the information um, when I've attended um, seminars and sessions about EU funding is that the, U e the UK, when we take part in the sort of cultural funding that comes through the EU, EU the various funding strands, um, that we've often done pretty well out of it when we take part. And it's only, unfortunately, fairly recently that the UK has become a more active partner in a lot of these creative collaborations across Europe. Um, and actually, apparently, we're quite well liked on the continent because we're very good at the evaluation and monitoring side of things and that sort of reporting. And we bring those kind of skills partly because we've been having to do it for a long time than some of the counterparts <laughs> in other countries. Um, and the issue is that, from what I can see, um, that there's potential that that money will not be replaced. And of course, there is also another strand of EU funding, which is all the sort of social funding, the infrastructure funding, that has benefited um, culture because of the venues that have been built, the transport that's better, and also just the social capital that's been built around this money. And it it's very rarely that if you collaborate and bring money together that you get less out of it. And the issue for me is that I don't think we've seen any indication from the UK government um, negotiations that they are intending to join as a non-EU member country, which you can do. <coughs> Switzerland, for example, is one example, and Norway. And there's a lot of, well, they put some money in so they can get the value out. And of course, the value is, goes beyond the money. It goes through the collaborations, the things people learn, the peer support. And, and um, the other thing is also beyond culture is also Erasmus or the sort of education and lifelong learning. So there's a lot in there that I think people haven't realized is not going to be there anymore. And we're going to note, I think you're gonna notice it when it's gone. Uh, sadly, uh, I very much agree with what you just said, uh, and also our committee has undertaken work regarding Erasmus. Uh, so, uh, it's, uh, there's a, a huge amount of uncertainty, uh, clearly. Uh, just uh, one final question, if I may, and that's just regarding the... Uh, it's been touched upon by colleagues earlier regarding the, the, the spread uh, across, uh, across the country. Uh, I represent an area uh, that's not a city. 
And uh, there is a, a perception that uh, the cities and, and larger population areas actually do obtain more per head as compared to areas uh, like mine. Uh, now, is that, a, is that a fair assessment in, uh, in your opinion to any of the panellists? Yeah. Well, I think um, in general that often happens um, because there's a larger concentration of groups because there's more people and, and activity. Um, I don't think I've got figures to hand that tell me exactly, but I'm aware that also in the traditional arts you will often find that the, um, a lot of the small groups will be interested in promoting their own local traditions. So there's often quite a good activity from that point of view. Whether they get a good funding share, um, I imagine that they probably don't get so much, but often that's because they are working at a level that they don't necessarily seek it. But again, that's where venues are very often very important, their opportunity to come together and meet somewhere um, and collaborate is really important. I think in terms of um, that would be a key part of looking at cultural infrastructure mm -hmm. and potentially entitlement, um, you know, and a human right to, to arts and culture and particularly for young people, what is your entitlement to be able to access uh, arts and culture near you um, of different kinds and in different ways and whether that's participating or um, consuming if you like. Um, so there's there, one of the things that was suggested, I believe, many years ago when Creative Scotland was set up was potentially having local um, offices or local officers in local areas. And um, anecdotally, again, I don't have figures to hand, but anecdotally, local authorities have reduced the number of arts officers, which means that their capacity at local authority level to engage in the kind of collaborative dialogue that would support everyone, the, that grassroots artist, provision without which nothing else happens ultimately um, has been eroded I think over time so um, anything that could be done to strengthen capacity for making those partnerships to support local artists in ways that are more efficient um, than I think as you said than individual artists having to, to, to reinvent that wheel multiple times I think members, um, members would welcome. Okay. Um, well I would just um uh, just to add what, to what Fiona was saying earlier on, <clears throat> I think it's very hard for um, artists to participate um, uh, when they have to travel uh, quite far. So we were just at an event um, organised by the Chart Network and it was um, clear that it was a huge effort for artists to attend that networking event, valuable as it was, um, because they had to spend up to six hours travelling to and from. So that's, um, you know, they might also have to arrange for care, they might have, that's a day out of their studio, um, and it's just that, you know, funding isn't generally available for that sort of support that enables artists to um, uh, help their professional development, but would be really useful. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Ross Greer. Thank you, Camille. I'd like to uh, get your thoughts on how we support grassroots art at an individual level or, or small groups. Quite a number of the written submissions that we received, in fact, including the one from uh, the Federation of Scottish Theatre, mentioned uh, bursaries and microfinancing. I was wondering what your thoughts are on what specifically that would fund. Is that how, how open-ended would you imagine that being, or would you like to see a system, if one was established, that was quite specific about things like travel, accommodation, materials, etc.? I think when we um, talk to artists, and I would say that our membership ranges from individual artists producing their own work through to um, Scottish Opera, in fact, and the National Theatre of Scotland, um, what they need is time and space. Um, and so while specific funds for training and travel and networking um, and writing bids is important, making art is about time and space. Um, so I guess I would advocate for an element of um, thinking in that decision-making process, whether that's through a universal benefit or whether that's through bursary support for individual artists, and whether that's distributed centrally or whether that is distributed through the existing network or a new network of cultural infrastructure. Many of my larger members already offer residencies, artist support um, events, mentoring, 
a wide range of activities already offered through the regular funded, the current regular funded network. So it may be that um, there is capacity there to to build on to support individual artists in that way. But I think ultimately it's about time and space. So just on that point about administration, sorry for bringing the others in, would you suggest then that that's best uh, administered uh, through the individual organisations rather than centrally Creative Scotland issuing to individual artists? That I think there are different opinions there. Some, I think it, you wouldn't want a situation where individual artists felt that they were unable to access the, the central funding body. That doesn't feel right. Um, but at the same time, there are already, as um, I think I said earlier, you know, supportive, engaged, informed people who are seeing the work. That's one of the problems that people say about the funders is that they don't always get the chance to see all of the work because so much is happening. Um, but people who are working in um, regular funded organisations often are very aware of what's happening. They're very aware of what work's going on. Um, I think looking at diversity, there would have to be safeguards to make sure that there was appropriate diversity in the people, anyone who was selected. We would all support that, um, I'm sure. But there, it does feel as though there are existing mechanisms out there for supporting individual artists that it might be possible to build on those rather than um, or perhaps in addition to building things from scratch. But I wouldn't say that um, I, in this, as in everything, a one-size-fits-all is unlikely to, to work. I'd advocate that, that time and space works not just for the career artists, but also for small and grassroots organisations. Um, some of them are very happy. They're, they're working at a certain level that they're sustainable because they're not relying on an external feed of money. Um, but they sometimes want to try something a bit new. Uh, or risky, or how they see it as that, and that could be the time and space they need to maybe put out some extra leaflets to try and get new people involved. It might be about trying a different space in the next door village, because people said they'd like to do the same thing over there, but and one of their members is prepared to travel there, but they need to have the, the money to go and get a space or something on those lines. Um, and so I'd be I'd be anxious not to sort of lock it down and say it's only for this because actually that then stifles creativity in itself um, I think it's that almost like that form that word development um, I know Volunteer Out Scotland has you know, some micro grants and um, that's one of the reasons is that groups can apply for what they need to develop um, the Tusker Small Arts Funding we get a I sit on the grant panel for that, and we get a wide range from you know the artists trying to develop their own artistic practice to an organisation trying to bring more participant activities to an island, um, or a different type of music within the traditional arts. So it's it's about trying to shape it, but in a way that it doesn't close it. Um, and I, I would echo actually that thing about professional development or that idea of being able to access opportunities. There have been times that even people, um, you know, maybe do things on an amateur basis, they're not expecting to be paid for it, but sometimes they have a professional development need along with the career artists, but being able to access that small amount of money that will allow them to travel, pay for the fee, could make all the difference to the community that they will bring stuff back to. And we also know that some activities cost more than others, and it's about being able to maybe take that risk to do something a bit more expensive and see if people want to do it and then people may be quite happy to say yes it will we'll continue and we're happy to pay another fiver but now we know what it's like so it's about you know that idea of trying something and, and I think risk is a very important thing that we need to be allowed to fail more often because I think there's a lot about you have to always be successful you always have to be smiling <laughs> um, and I, I think that's an important thing that's been lost in in the the defence of public funding, you want to be able to also take risk. But people with smaller pots of money, people become more risk averse. So it's just a point. Thank you. Um, Irene, do you have anything on this specific point? Um, well, I suppose just um, flexibility of funding. So as well as you know the value in microfunding and seed funding, um, a more sustained approach so that funding can be available over a longer period for individual artists or smaller organizations can make an enormous difference. Um, it's very hard to develop your career or develop your ideas in, in finite periods. So I think um, providing a guarantee of some sustained funding as well is really essential. 
Thanks. Um, and just one point to, to pick up on briefly, um, Jude, you mentioned uh, a universal benefit potentially for, for individual artists. Uh, that's something that's come up in, in previous sessions around the, the concept of a universal basic income. There are four local authorities in Scotland who have committed to taking forward trials on that. What do you think the, the impact of, of a UBI would be for arts in the creative sector? And if the trials are to go ahead, how do you think artists in the, the cultural sector in those four areas should be considered when designing those trials? I, I'd say yes, we should try it and we should definitely have people in there because I think it will allow not just people who want to make a career out of the arts class, but also be able to enable other people to expand that side of things which may make them a happier person, may be more productive and things like that. I, I was also, I was reading back the evidence and I was thinking that there's also that aspect of a universal basic income for groups maybe. So you're talking about grassroots, maybe there could be something about some of these important organisations that don't necessarily want to get too big. That's the other thing is we always think bigger is better, but sometimes keeping small and fleet of foot is really important. Um, you know, universal basic income for some groups could make a lot of difference to how they're able to then source other income, earn income, support other people. For example, the idea of writing funding applications, supporting that. You know, there is a lot of expertise out there, but people aren't able to afford that capacity to help other people. So it's just a thought, universal basic income, not just for individuals, but maybe certain groups. Yes, I think there's um, our industry, of course, has many freelancers at its heart. Um, and the, the, the struggle for members to survive whilst writing unfunded applications, um, while waiting for applications to come in, uh, whilst being kind of the bedrock in local communities, you know, the artists live in local communities, they're part of those local communities. Um, and I would certainly advocate that as a sector which is already um, quite literally in some cases a gig economy, um, it might be a really fertile test bed to say how does this work in practice, what is it that people need. Um, I know that speaking and again anecdotally to members who were in receipt of the benefits that, that it used to be possible to get um, back in the 80s, um, that people were able to get housing benefit and I think it was an extra £10 a week um, on, the, on the, the unemployment benefit in order to set up as a small business and many creative people did that and many of the, much of the flourishing that we have now is really as a direct consequence of people having access to a roof over their head and a basic level of um, money coming in for a period to enable them to get going if they're going to be professional but I think then there's the other issue of community and engagement um, and and again not wanting to keep that too rigid um, so it's about flexibility to enable people to um, make the, the right contribution for them and to be able to grow their own practice in ways that are good for their community as well as for themselves and that will also ultimately be economic because some of those people um, will fly. Some of those people will be the people that make the money that comes back into the system that supports everyone else in future. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I am Maria, but no? Well, Thank you, Convener. Okay, um, thank you very much. And that was um, a very interesting and wide-ranging discussion. And uh, thanks for coming in to speak to us today. And now we shall suspend briefly to change over our panel of witnesses.
Uh, can I now welcome our next panel of witnesses? We have Nick Stewart from the Music Venue Trust, and we have David Lane, Head of Arts, Music and Cultural Venues at Glasgow Life. Um, can I thank you both for coming to give evidence to us today? Um, uh, we're looking at uh, our infrastructure, our cultural infrastructure, as part of our inquiry in this particular session. And of course, um, this panel allows us to talk about the importance of our capital infrastructure. Uh, the committee has been trying to do outreach as part of this inquiry. And uh, uh, last week, we went to Dunfermline uh, to the uh, fire station creative um, uh, which was very interesting in that um, they obviously have created a, a new cultural venue out, out of nothing and uh, certainly the evidence that we took from artists across Fife there was that just having that piece of capital infrastructure had been quite transformative uh, for individual artists and artists' organisations and having an additional uh, venue. So it really certainly brought home to, to me anyway uh, the importance of, of capital um, uh, in actually transforming uh, uh, the opportunities uh, for artists themselves, which is a big theme of our inquiry, how we actually support uh, individual artists. Uh, so perhaps I wonder if, um, if you could perhaps give us your view on the existing capital infrastructure available to support uh, the arts across Scotland uh, and what the particular challenges are uh, face facing artists um, in terms of uh, showcasing their work. Uh, who would like to start? Uh, Mr Lang. I think I've been volunteered. <laughs> um, so I can speak mainly, I suppose, for what are perceived to be the issues in Glasgow specifically. Um, but um, it may be that some of them um, apply um, across the country uh, to some extent or another. Um, there is significant capital or building-based, if you like, um, cultural infrastructure um, within the city and within other cities. Um, and those um, usually take the form of venues. Um, I would also like to talk at some point about the, the role that kind of key festivals and uh, local arts officers play in part of that infrastructure. But in terms of physical infra infrastructure, um, I think the evidence that you've heard there in Fife is, um, certainly would apply um, in those cases. Venues, um, when they are established um, as arts venues within certain geographical areas, can certainly do have a transformative effect on the opportunities for artists. And they do that in a number of ways. Um, and the challenges that they face uh, are linked to each of those ways. So one of the key things that sometimes is, that we hear about a lot from artists and organisations that we work with is that venues need to and succeed more in boosting the artistic uh, sector when they can offer time and space and support for the development and making of new work as well as the showing and performance uh, of, of work to audiences. Um, and that is something that we hear uh, regularly. Um, so not all venues have the space or the variety of spaces to allow that to go on while also having public facing spaces um, for audiences to attend work. Um, but it is a key function of a, of a good, strong network of, of, of arts venues or, or an arts venue in a particular location to be able to offer. The other thing um, that's very important is that venue-based producers, um, individual art form specialists, um, curators, um, obviously form a they form a, a, a crucial way for individual artists to connect with the network and find out about and take advantage of opportunities at local, national, and international level. Um, it's a really good way for an artist to have a pipeline from working as an individual completely alone to having a first small show within a venue that itself is internationally recognised, that starts to put them on other radars, if you like, um, where venues can function really well. Tramley is a good example of this, I believe, in Glasgow. Um, they can offer a range of sizes of shows or spaces to present work and develop work over a period of time, and thus can kind of support individual artists through um, a whole initial and mid-career stage and fully professional, high profile kind of career stage by supporting um, at all of those levels in, in different ways. Um, so uh, that is 
some of the ways in which I think that the venue infrastructure is important and, and currently functions. The pressures, the challenges are that they are, uh, in many cases, funded entirely locally. Uh, so there's only perhaps city council or local authorities that are funding them. Um, there is huge pressure on, on, on that resource and those funding streams. And while um, there is a lot of work and attention going on behind the scenes and being paid to addressing that. It is a it's a demographic and a you know a, a public sector finance pressure as a whole. And um, that means that all of those beneficial ways in which a, a good arts venue can support individual artists and audiences um, to make and see work. Um, all of those functions are under pressure um, as well in turn. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stewart. Uh, yes, so uh, the ways in which, uh, speaking for grassroots music venues, the ways in which uh, venues such as ours uh, benefit artists is that we are the research and development uh, arm of the UK music industry. So the industry itself last year was worth 4.4 billion, and yet the, uh, the place where, um, say, the rock and pop and wider versions of that part of the sector um, hone their craft where they initially perform, etc., um, are very seriously under threat. There's a, a real infrastru crumbling infrastructure issue there. So the um, requests, uh, in, in short, from the Music Venue Trust, where, where funding could be available, would be to put it into infrastructure to improve the quality of the venues themselves, and uh, some money for um, talent development programmes, where we're able to take the next generation of talent, put them on in uh, a better environment than what we currently have, and to take them up to the next levels thereafter. Okay. What are the reasons for the decline in the number of venues? Well, they're manifold. So live music is, um, is obviously very popular at the moment. Um, it continues to grow uh, greatly at the, at the top end. Um, but uh, increased costs of rent, uh, stagnating ticket sale, sorry, ticket prices have been a factor. Um, lower sales of alcohol are really big at the moment. And there's an issue where um, the GMVs tend to be seen as pubs that put on music, at least that's what our rateable value is tied to, etc. Um, traditionally, the, the sector has always existed completely in the commercial sphere, um, but there's now an issue where we have a, a market failure where you can't really get by by losing money on ticket sales and then making up the rest through alcohol sales. In the longer run, that's not sustainable. Right, okay. Um, and how do you think that problem should be solved? Um, there uh, should be funding for grassroots music venues. Um, a very similar set of evidence to what you were sent was sent to the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport uh, down south. And it, uh, one of the recommendations was that Arts Council England should be funding grassroots music venues. And uh, some big news, and so why I'm getting to this quite quickly, is that um, since we submitted our evidence, Arts Council England have agreed to make a ring-fenced fund of £1.5 million for grassroots music venues in England. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have also allowed Music Venue Trust to second a member of Arts Council staff to make sure that those grants are applied for and that the money is received. Right. That okay. money is uh, all to be paid out by March next year. Right. I don't think Creative Scotland at the moment have a good idea about how they would be able to do any kind of proportionally matched fund. And we're beginning to have some discussions with them. Right, OK, so you've already started to speak to them about that. Do you think there's an understanding, the same level of understanding here as there is in down south about the nature of the problem? Uh, this conversation we're having is, is part of the growth of that understanding. The Music right. Venue Trust has been around for five years. Um, I often speak for Music Venue Trust, but I'm a small venue operator. I run a place called Sneaky Pete's on the mm -hmm. Cowgate, so not far from here. Um, and those arguments have been uh, ones we've been starting to have over the last few years. Uh, there was more of an understanding last year that what we would do was we would try and get more of a uh, pipeline investment fund that comes from the industry. But since Arts Council of really straight England have really straight away recognised the importance of supporting what could otherwise be a crumbling infrastructure, um, I think it's on Creative Scotland now to look at what they can do about that. Um, if you've got a situation where a venue in Berwick upon Tweed can apply for funds that a venue in North Berwick can't. Clearly, there's, there's an issue in the parity there. Mm -hmm. And how are you defining a grassroots music 
venue can you know like is there a definition in terms of the arts council definition england which, as to who uh, can so, apply sorry there is a definition which um you will have received in the evidence that came through before but essentially we're talking about a network of just over 500 um, smaller music venues mostly independently owned who program primarily um new music um and who uh have a direct relationship with the artists themselves as well. So generally, GMVs are under 500 capacity, and they are all the places where the future stars uh, learn their trade. Okay, thank you very much. That's very interesting, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. I have one question for David Lang. If he's able to answer this question, it might have been better directed at the chief executive of Glasgow Life. But we have heard some disappointment, a degree of disappointment, around uh, the operation of Truss, and. I don't know if you want to comment, if, if this has developed because we've been through a time of austerity where funding to local authorities has been tight and that's had an impact on the few trusts that we have in, in Scotland, and whether there is merit to a trust model when we're looking at sustainable funding, do you think they have been effective in drawing in additional money that local authorities who haven't moved to that model have maybe found more challenging? I think um, that there is information available which I would be happy to arrange to supply um, af perhaps after the event. But speaking very broadly, um, my understanding is that yes, in terms of the proportion of um, expenditure uh, and income that uh, a, a charitable um, trust such as Glasgow Life um, now has passing through its hands, if you like, the proportion has shifted um, from uh, the, the degree to which the um, local authority is directly um, accounting for, um, or the, the, the size of the proportion that is accounted for by um, grant directly from local authority, um, has reduced quite significantly. And the other sources of funding, be they certain types of um, commercial or semi-commercial trading, um, leveraging in um, grants from other external and funding bodies and other types of trusts who maybe specialise in particular areas, um, art form specific funds, uh, European and international funds, various links. Um, I think there is, um, my understanding is there's some evidence to show that, uh, yes, that it has been successful in both um, reducing certain types of costs uh, and also increasing um, other funding streams into the mix so that the, the proportion uh, is slightly rebalanced over, over time. And I believe that that is there and I would be happy to arrange to supply that. That's, that's great, thank you. Um, so earlier, you, I think you were both in, I asked questions about cutting the cake or increasing the size of the cake. I don't, it's changed into a pie during the course of the morning, but um, I don't think um, anyone's going to disagree with increasing the size, but you both in your submissions did discuss issues around the way that it's cut. And David, you had talked about um, existing power structures that exhibit institutional racism, ableism and classicist discrimination and there should be consideration given to um, the benefits of cultural, social and economic prosperity for everyone. So you made uh, arguments around social inclusion and, um, and discrimination. And Nick, you gave figures that showed the amount, you have 36% um, of funding going to classical music and it's less than 5% going to contemporary music. Um, and I suppose it links to Kenneth Gibson's earlier question about Scottish opera. So, Nick, do you want to clarify? To extend to that, that 0% um, of the RFO went to grassroots music venues, which are the venues that yeah. the sector that I specifically can talk about. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you, you did go on to say that yeah, there's no support at all goes to the mm. area that you're representing. Yeah. Do you want to maybe comment on the issue around is it more funding that's needed or are there issues with the way in which the current funding is distributed? Nick, if you want to go first, then. I'll sure. If I could say quickly, first of all, I think clearly there should be a bigger cake and a giant pie. Um, and uh, from our point of view, we think that if there is a question about how much proportionally should be spent, we're not asking for a lot, but we think that there should be more than zero. That's certainly the case. Uh, the figure in England until this recent announcement was also very, very small. It was 0.03% of Arts Council England's spending for the RFOs, but actually we won't be talking about RFOs or NPOs, we'll be talking about really targeted funding which has to come from strategy and Creative Scotland's strategy is a little bit up in the air at the moment. So until we have strategy we can't really create those targeted funds. Um, 
So, yes, I think there should be a situation where um, Scotland's, and I, I, I wouldn't like to pen it just into rock and roll, but there's a sense in which you can more or less understand what grassroots music, ven music venues tend to do when you talk about rock and roll sector and the research development of that. Um, that uh, I'm sorry, lost a little bit here. Um, these, these should be and can be seen as culturally prestigious. I think that money goes to ballet, theatre, opera, before, it, before you get to what the money that's then spent by Creative Scotland and distributed thereafter. So not the money that comes from the direct government to portfolio organisations. Um, that these matter in terms of people's uh, sense of what they are as Scots, as people's um, perception of what Scotland is, uh, they're hugely important in cu Scotland's cultural output. But in terms of where they're funded or the amount of funding that they get, they're not viewed as prestigious at all. And I think that that, um, that standpoint needs to be changed. I think there's a common conception that um, Scots love to go to see live music, that in Glasgow, the venues couldn't be busier, and there's a huge amount of them. Um, but, but where does the funding go? And historically, because GMBs have always existed in the purely commercial sphere, uh, they haven't had the conversations with potential funders with Creative Scotland. When I went to see Creative Scotland recently, they really hadn't had someone from a venue like mine come and have a, a long chat with them that might lead to some other chats. So it's quite new, all this. Um, but we haven't had a seat at the table, and if you're, if you're not at the table, then you're probably lunch. Uh, just before I bring David in, Nick, do you want to say, just to finish this, a wee bit about... Um because the convener just asked the question, you mentioned market failure. So if you look at um, a few years ago, tenant sponsorship used to sponsor a network of local grassroots venues and they supported bands on tours. We're going back to the early 90s, late 80s type. And then they moved their support more towards Tea in the Park and big um, festivals. And we do see huge growth in ticket sales on that end of the music business. But you are you're reporting that there's been a fall off at the more grassroots level. I don't think it's true to say that there are less sales at GMBs, um, but the standard of infrastructure is decreasing because there's not quite enough income going on there. I said there's a stagnation in ticket prices. Live music on the whole is more popular. Um, the venues that are doing very well are doing very well. The venues that are not are doing poorly, and in particularly if those venues are not in Edinburgh and Glasgow, um, when you lose a venue like that, you don't really tend to get another one to replace it. So there's definitely a problem with market failure in, yeah. in more rural areas. And I think in your um, briefing for us, you did... So you, you said 1.5 million have come from the Arts Council England, and that's a recent announcement. But I think in the Sound and Vision report, you talked mm -hmm. about match funding from the, uh, from the sector, from that's the correct. commercial so end of the sector. So there is a plan uh, that uh, Music Venue Trust has where uh, they could unlock a lot of match funds to be able to kit out 100 uh, grassroots music venues by, I think the date is now 2023, uh, if correct funding was in place. Now, uh, the amount of money that's come from Arts Council England isn't quite enough, um, but there could be a serious improvement in the standard of venues that we have in Scotland um, with the correct funding for infrastructure from Creative Scotland. Or should it be elsewhere, then fine, but I personally think that Creative Scotland is probably the correct instrument to be able to give funds to grassroots music venues to improve infrastructure. Okay, thank and you. And that would probably come through the creative industries team. But again, these were just conversations we're beginning to have at the moment. Because mm. the creative industries team so it takes another tangent, but my understanding is that the Scottish enterprise are the body mm -hmm. that still has the budget for creative, in, for creative enterprises and industries. Um, and Creative Scotland doesn't really have much of a budget for this at all. It just comes in... The, the officer that I speak to uh -huh. uh, at Creative Scotland who takes care of Creative Industries team is at Creative Scotland. So yeah. where his funds come from exactly, I'm not sure, yeah. except that he is yeah. the person that I speak to. So do you have any involvement as a, because it is a, as a business, mm -hmm. with Scottish Enterprise, do they give any support that you're aware of to... No, and again, that's, I think that's a set of conversations that haven't yeah. really uh -huh. begun generally, but perhaps Glasgow Life has more of these kind of conversations and maybe you can speak on that, David. Okay, thank you. And David, sorry to go back to the original question, I'll try not to take up too much time, but around you had commented around the distribution of funds and that the cultural sector is not representative of the general population and expressed some concerns about diversity and accessibility and those issues. Do you want to say a bit more about that? 
Uh, yes, um, I think it's um, quite widely, widely acknowledged that the, it's particularly the professional art sector, if you like, um, is not um, hugely diverse in some ways, um, and therefore there are clearly mechanisms at work somewhere in the in, in the system that are um, tending to exclude um, some people. Um, I don't think that we have the answers particularly to that issue, um, but I think it is fair to say that we believe that consideration should be given to those issues along along with other considerations around um, the health of the art sector itself, you know, as it currently stands. Um, I want to just come back quickly on one point and, uh, and just really agree um, with Nick about the historical perception of uh, music as an art form and how it should be supported, um, particularly contemporary or what's often referred to as pop and rock, um, and in our evidence did also suggest that um, in the same way as all other art forms, small music venues and small um, mu mu musical groups and individual musicians should be considered for support on an artistic basis, you know, in, in the same way um, as other art forms are. Um, sorry, perhaps you could remind me, and I'll, I'll come try and come back more to the point maybe for us. No, that, that's, that's yeah. fine, that answer. Um, I suppose the other thing I wanted to speak, you had talked I would about... Like say something really quickly on diversity. I would like to say something really quickly on diversity, which is that um, it's quite important that if you support uh, music, but art forms generally from the grassroots up, that you will automatically get diversity. If you put all your funding into uh, more traditional art forms, and by which I mean those, those art forms which have tended to get funding, whether it be theatre, opera, ballet, yes, uh, those art forms can all say that they have got people from lots of different uh, economic backgrounds and lots of ethnic diversity from the people involved in it, but they are still making the same kinds of art forms and where you will get um, the next levels of... Uh, development in the art forms is where you get people who come from different backgrounds to represent the the types of art forms that they come from not what they have been schooled into through the conservatoire okay. Okay. Yeah, that other come in. Sorry, thanks very so. much ross thanks. Yeah. Um, just to follow on this point um that nick made uh, there about prestige and a lot of it's included in in david's uh, written evidence you know, um and it's quite obvious opera has prestige uh, hip hop often uh, does not and how how do we tackle an issue like that within our public bodies? Because it, it, it seems that that ultimately comes down to who's in the room when funding decisions are being made or when the structure of a funding pot is being decided on. So how do you increase diversity at the level that is distributing the funds rather than... We obviously want to increase diversity in the arts itself, but you have to go upstream to do that, it would strike me. Uh, yes, well, it's that's a, a great question, and it's one that um, it is talked about and discussed a, a fair bit, certainly um, with the organisations and artists uh, and institutions that we work with. Um, there are a few, I guess, broad ways in which we hear, as an organisation, from people might might be beneficial to look at. One key thing probably is to be quite artist and audience led. Um, so the art sector has a professional element to it, um, but it also needs to be it needs to be opened up. Um, if you can involve uh, individual artists and individual people at a very grassroots level, very early stages, um, then that should tend to help promote diversity and overcome a sort of institutional inertia around what is funded or what is perceived to be prestigious. Um, being, I think through Tramway's work, for example, it's probably fair to say we feel that the experimental art forms and art forms that are difficult to categorise are very fertile ground for the kind of new thinking and new ways of working um, that is therefore more exciting and more diverse and, 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 and less in a, in a sort of um, defined and formal, you know, um, type of art form that you may see uh, elsewhere. Um, so having capacity, both organisational and financial, to take risk, to experiment, to um, work from artist level, individual artist level up and build around that as opposed to 
the structure and organisation leading everything and, 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 and then only funnelling through the, the artists and art forms that fit that institution's ideas is, is really uh, important. Um, the, the socio-economic um, factors behind why uh, that lead to um, some of the lack of diversity at the, in, in, in the prof sort of professional <laughs> art sector are often to do with the, 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 the legacy of the sector often being based around people who can work on a free inter internship, um, people who can uh, have that support to go and do a stint in another or arts organisation and start building a CV that's not open to everyone uh, by any means. Um, and there's a parallel issue around individual artists who can't participate sometimes in even uh, types of consultations or being asked to be on panels that select work. Um, even when institutions do try and have wider panels that are not just salaried, you know, arts professionals who are look, sitting on them, that is important, efforts have been made. Those people then have to be paid in a way that a salaried, uh, an institution can send a, an arts officer or a, a specialist along to a selection panel to sit on it to help select artists. Individual artists, that's a whole, that might be the, the whole day that they were planning to be chasing up leads for commissions that might actually make you know the difference between them surviving another year as an artist or not. Um, now, as an organisation, we've made some specific changes around how, how we do that in terms of paying for attendance at consultations and supporting freelancers when we commission work, but we don't have enough resource to make a wholesale you know, revolution in that regard, but we are uh, trying to take conscious steps all the time to, to work more in that way, and it does seem to be an issue that is quite significant in terms of the end results. Uh, and who is uh, in those positions of influence that you mentioned. And Nick, you mentioned that the discussions you've had with Creative Scotland recently are perhaps n not ones that they've had, at least for quite a while. Uh, your sector is not one that they, they engage with often. Mm. From the sector's point of view, do you feel that this is an issue of uh, a perception that Creative Scotland's doors would be closed if folk approached them, or that they seem so distant that for a lot of folk in the sector, they wouldn't even really know where to start. They wouldn't know the first person to actually get in touch with at Creative Scotland to try and get a meeting and to try and get discussions going. I feel that there is a will from Creative Scotland to try and do something for the sector. Um, the music officer and historically music officers at Creative Scotland have more recently tended to be people who come from uh, our sort of contemporary background. Um, so there have been some struggles for them to try and work out how it is that they would benefit. They don't get enough applications and venues that have tried to apply for open funding uh, in the past, uh, particularly for the um, Made in Scotland Fund, um, have tended not to receive funds for that. Some of that is to do with uh, the specifics of open funding. So, uh, for instance, the cycle of time that it takes to get an application in. Now, uh, if I book a show really far ahead of schedule, uh, at this point, if I was to book a show and it was really far ahead of schedule, it would be November. But if I was to apply for funding for Made in Scotland, I'd be applying now to put on a show in August next year. So historically, when I've tried to go apply for that kind of fund, and to be fair, we're very organised, um, and not all GMBs have got that privilege of being as organised as we are because they're busy fixing the loose. Um, we haven't received those funds because we will have to say, well, we will put on someone we think will be great who will be touring around about then, and that just doesn't cut it for an application. So um, in terms of the ability to fund talent development programs or the ability to fund uh, touring to work on contemporary music schedules, um, the current open funding model is slightly ill-suited. There is uh, a better model for that, uh, which we, um, so Sneaky Beats, the venue that I run, uh, is almost unique in the UK in that we have a bursary from the PRS Foundation. Um, it's small, it's 10,000 pounds a year, which we spend exclusively on artist fees. Because we have a track record of putting on great bands, and for developing careers, um, we receive a bursary which we are allowed to then spend on the artists that we choose to spend money on. Um, Creative Scotland have said that, that we would potentially be open to the idea, and I can't quote anyone here, of doing uh, talent development programmes along those lines. Um, but again, these are the beginning of conversations, and the big ask from the Music Venue Trust right now is for investment in infrastructure, um, and then later on, talent development programmes. But if talent development programme funding comes first, we'll take it. Grand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, David, sorry. 
Um, Nick, Nick makes an important point, and it reminds me that there's something that I should have mentioned in response to the previous question around so, so, some ways to tackle um, uh, lack of diversity, um, and it's related to this idea that key venues in key locations whose whose teams or specialists are kind of deeply connected to their sector, um, like Sneaky Pete's, um, or, like, or like a venue like Tramway, or an organisation like Glasgow Life, um, when they hold... Um, sort of smaller sub schemes, if you like, sub streams of funding that they then distribute in turn. That can be very powerful. Um, there's a couple of examples within uh, within Glasgow um, that we're involved in uh, managing on behalf of the city. One is the um, arts development scheme under the Integrated Grant Fund, uh, and one is the Visual Art uh, Makers uh, Development Scheme. Now, in in both cases, what we find in terms of the individual artists and small organisations who apply and are successful for these funds is that they tend, for various reasons, to be much more diverse than the bigger organisations who secure other streams of funding. And I believe that a large part of the reason for that, well, there, I think I believe there are two main reasons for that. One is that um, because we as an organisation have had the capacity to fulfil a lot of the bureaucracy and management and uh, form filling, if you like, that went along with getting the original sort of total fund, if you like, um, we have been able to then take all of that out of the equation for smaller arts organisations or individual artists. And the system that they then have to apply to is just a very light touch, simple, quick one where they're applying to us. Our officers are doing all the work of translating that into what then the original funder, be that the council or, or another body, then require. And that's a really important role, actually, that um, a support role that individual artists do need from the sector, that there are, if you like, there is a bureaucracy that happens. It's not necessarily the case that, although you want to be artist-led, artists want to be doing that. So in having these sorts of locally embedded schemes with um, arts officers who are deeply connected in their, in their local area, who can create a process that's very light touch, quick and easy for the artist, and then can take care of the rest and bundle that up and, uh, and take care of the, the sort of upwards um, flow then of reporting and evaluation and equalities um, uh, tracking and all these things. That can be very powerful. And we see from the list of organisations and artists that benefit from these smaller schemes um, that they um, tend, for various reasons, to be much more diverse than the art sector as a whole. And they tend to be quite fragile organisations. And in many cases, these sort of small grants of two, three, four, five thousand pounds are absolutely crucial to their survival, but they're working with communities or in art forms or with individual artists that are otherwise underrepresented and so um, do feel that that is a, an area that could be essentially, quite simply, if that was a bigger fund that we were managing in that way, then we could amplify that effect quite considerably and relatively straightforwardly. Um, the, other, the, other, the other role that's important is making sure that there is a way for those individual artists who might be coming from a different uh, uh, cultural background, uh, they, may have, uh, they may be new uh, uh, citizens of Glasgow, um, that they have locally accessible not just funds but people who can connect them with the wider high profile opportunities that are going on. Um, so how do you get a slot on one of the um, prestigious festivals that might you know happen within Glasgow that we might Glasgow Life might be involved in or, or, or others. Um, and it's local officers and investing in that capacity that can actually really help connect people to those opportunities so that they're given a, a platform and it's not uh, always just the same people that are getting the benefit of those high profile platforms. The, the infrastructure of festivals and, and, and high profile moments for showcasing are and helping give individual artists a real step up in their careers. I don't think the importance of those can be overstated. Thank you. Uh, just the first question, it's, it's a point of clarification really, it's to, to Nick. Um, in your uh, written statement uh, under uh, e, uh, E1, uh, it states that uh, significantly reduced audience attendances. But to a, a question, it's from Claire Baker's question to you earlier on, uh, you stated that it's not necessarily fewer people actually attending venues. So I'd be grateful if you can just clarify uh, which of those are, are correct, please. My experience in Edinburgh and doing shows in Glasgow is that attendances are good across GMBs in the whole of the UK. I think sales may be down in certain areas. Um, one of the 
uh, as I say, live music keeps expanding and things are getting tougher for GMBs. One of the big uh, factors that we face uh, is that so many more people are going to festivals now. Um, we've seen a couple of festivals, sadly, in Scotland collapse over the last couple of months. Um, in roughly 1970, there were about 150 live music festivals in the UK. In the year 2010, there were 1,000. In 2019, there are 3,000. So there's a threefold growth to uh, an unsustainable number within that time, and that has a lot of impact upon GMVs as well. So live music continues to grow. Um, I don't personally, although you have some figures in front of you, have those figures on uh, attendance for venues. I believe that attendance for live music in the UK is generally very good, um, but it's still hard for GMVs. Uh, I mean, with that, um, with, the, with the wider music industry, um, is it a feeling that um, obviously it's good that people are going to uh, are going out to go to watch and listen to live music, but is it a feeling that um, people are doing that because they've been fed a diet of, of the big stars on a daily basis uh, on the radio and TV, um, so they're not actually getting an opportunity to actually listen to uh, potentially new and upcoming uh, singers and bands. Or, oh, sorry, apologies. I think there's more diversity of listening now than there have, ever has been, and I think streaming has really enabled that to happen. Okay. Um, there's also a real diversity in media outlets from which people can get music, and the rate of discovery, as platforms like Spotify describe it as, um, seems to be increasing. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that there are more professionals, and I think the hurdles to get over before you can call yourself a professional musician now are, are much stronger. I think you would need to be doing tours of venues that were, say, 800 to 1,000 capacity size in the UK and Europe before you could say that your main income within uh, my part of the contemporary sphere uh, would, be, would be as a musician. So, no, I don't think it's just the big headline artists getting all of the, all of the pie, but clearly they do get a lot. Mm. There's beginning to be an understanding from the industry that, and um, this is the Music Venue Trust Pipeline Investment Fund, that the industry should be giving back to the smaller venues for the development role that they do. Um, I across the continent, for instance in France, there's a 3% tax on all tickets that goes towards the grassroots. Um, and I think the UK industry may at some stage agree to do some small tax or some other way of paying it back. There's small commitments from some of the ticketing companies and the record labels are still keeping away from it at the moment. The major promoters are not very interested in it, but in other European countries they do have agreements where they have to do it and they have been fairly willing to do so. So we'll see what happens in that part. Well, that certainly kind of led me on to that area of questioning because you quoted uh, Steve Lamarck uh, in your submission uh, and I thought his quote generally was extremely interesting. Uh, and the, so in terms of the industry, notwithstanding also what you just said, uh, do the industry actually uh, put anything back in at all? Because also if you're here today also highlighting the issue of Creative Scotland and also about public money, but the industry themselves, do they actually help or invest at all? There is a request now that the industry does much more to do so. I think uh, the industry does at times uh, and in ways philanthropically choose to fund uh, music education and things like that, but it's really, it's really small beans compared to the bigger picture. And as I say, uh, UK music industry was worth 4.4 billion last year, and there's a lot of venues that can't afford to fix the locks on the toilet doors right now, in terms of their capacity and time they have for the staff to fix things properly. Okay. No, thank, thank, you. You. Uh, thank you, Kenneth. Yeah, thanks sir. very much, convener, and uh, good morning, panel, and thank you for your excellent uh, submissions. And, uh, Nick, um, you talked earlier on about the the grants that are going to be provided to the UK, and you're looking to, and you're obviously suggesting we do something similar here. I mean, I noticed that in your own submission, you talked in the area where you're defining grassroots music venues. Uh, you talk about, uh, for example, um, what what defines it in terms of equipment. So you talk about stage monitors, light and rig, drum kit, back line, stage microphone, stage box and snake spare instruments, instrument consumables, signal processors, recording rig, uh, etc. Uh, Alexander knows a lot more about these things than, than than the rest of us. But is that the kind of stuff that you feel would be really good to be able to get a grant for? So, for example, if we uh, or, or if there was a, a, a kind of um, fund set up in Scotland, um, you know, grassroots venues could bid specifically to say, look, um, we really need to replace this new bit of equipment. Um, I mean, you talk, for example, about still a lot of analogue being used in venues. You talk about um, some of the equipment not being in, as, as environmentally um, a, a, a good as it should be. Um, is this the kind of stuff that you're thinking about, you know, um, specifically 
items of, 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 of that to level of infrastructure? Yes, it's that type of infrastructure. And uh, in the details of the Sound and Vision product that you have there, mm -hmm. um, specifically, I think that to have uh, a, a, a proportional to the English award, kind of award coming into Scot to Scotland, would exactly do that. So if it's 100 venues across uh, the UK, then roughly speaking, it's, it's 9.6 or 10 venues in Scotland. And it can make a huge difference to upgrade the infrastructure in 10 venues to start with. Yeah. Yeah. And so it is that kind of infrastructure for sure. Um, uh, other, when you uh, invest in the infrastructure that way, you massively increase uh, audience experience. You make the live music much more attractive, mm -hmm. but it also frees up uh, the venues to then spend any leftover sums that they may have to work on audience development and their talent development programs to give better fees to touring artists. Uh, venues are very efficient in the way they spend money. They spend what they can. They almost always spend all of their money. And I think you have a figure there somewhere that says that venues spend 130% of their ticket income on artist fees, mm -hmm. so, or rather on putting on the shows. Mm -hmm. So they're already running at a loss, which they're subsidizing from alcohol sales. Mm -hmm. When the alcohol sales really start to disappear, and I believe there's a news story yesterday saying that mm -hmm. Scotland's alcohol sales uh, last year turned out to be at the historic low. It's not sustainable that we continue to try and operate as pubs in order to be able to put on bands. So where we can improve the quality of experience, we'll be able to continue to develop <coughs> audiences and we're going to be able to continue to develop audiences for the next generation of musicians coming through in Scotland. To be fair, the, the, Ali did debate on this issue yesterday in the figures in terms of alcohol consumption. The reduction tends to be in high-strength, low-cost alcohols, which we're obviously trying to mm -hmm. reduce because of the impact, the, the social and economic impact. Of but that. I can so say that the, <coughs> the reports that we have from Eventbrite and others have done great reports on youth trends over the last few years has definitely shown a reduction in the consumption of alcohol in young people and the young people who go out to music venues. Um, more specifically, people who go to music venues drink less than people who go to pubs for a drink. Um, typically it'd be one or two beers. The, so the spend per head is much lower. Uh, as I often say, uh, running a music venue is a crap way to run a pub. And uh, putting on live music is a crap way to increase the value of your pub. Okay. So to go back to equipment, would you envisage a situation whereby the, the kind of um, the venue put up, say, say you're uh, you investing in a piece of equipment that say cost five thousand mm pounds, -hmm. the venue would put up say twenty percent of that, and the rest would be providing a grant. Is that the kind of way you see it? Some kind of balance rather yeah. than just an outright grant for the piece of equipment? Because I think anyone who's funding would want to say, well, we want to show that the, we want the venue to at least show some kind of. Mm -hmm you know, uh, determination to invest in its own business. How, how would you see that working, these grants? Uh, it could work on any one of those models. And as you'll notice in the details of Sound and Vision there, the point is to get money from uh, governments, ideally, to unlock funding that we already have. Mm -hmm. And there's match funding available. And some of that actually comes from the PA and lighting companies as well. And part of that is about building for them longer term relationships as well. Now, interestingly, there's nine, there's nine members of this committee actually uh, uh, the two are unable to be here at the moment for other reasons, but none of us represent Glasgow or Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. And yet I noticed that uh, in the uh, the Scottish uh, Music Alliance, uh, 27 of the 47 venues are in Glasgow and Edinburgh, which is about 20% of Scotland's population. We've got some real con concerns, that I certainly do, over... Uh, how Creative Scotland and other organisations spread their funding. I mean, um, for example, in North Ayrshire, where I represent, um, the per capita spend is 25 times higher in Glasgow than in North Ayrshire. Now, we know there's, a, there's obviously always going to be more venues in the cities because people go into them, but it, d do you feel that there's a, an opportunity with, uh, uh, to, to actually ensure that, um, that some of these resources are actually invested outside the, the big cities, for example, and venues, and how do we stimulate the growth of venues in other parts of uh, Scotland rather than having a focus in, I mean, I know Sneaky Pete's in Edinburgh, but mm -hmm. in other parts of uh, uh, Scotland... Um, uh, I and the Music Venue Trust are all for uh, ensuring that we maintain whatever network we have outside the bigger cities of smaller music venues. Mm -hmm. um, those are those who are, which are most at risk. And under current situations where you have uh, rent hikes, for instance, Sneaky Pete's, uh, our landlord is currently trying to increase our rent by 45%. Mm -hmm. um, rates went up by 50% for us uh, two years ago. Um, I if you're in a rural area with a, or an outside a city area, where you have uh, a smaller audience to play to. Obviously, these financial concerns are much more extreme. Um, it's not for me to divide the pie, mm -hmm. but I do think that if you lose a venue, 
now in those areas. Uh, I don't know what kind of person would choose to then open an almost certainly loss-making business, mm -hmm. i.e. a live music venue, under those circumstances. So it's about maintaining before we grow. E and yes, if you think that, in your opinion, uh, there should be more money given out to venues in those areas, I would say the venues that are most needed um, certainly deserve to have a cut of the pie. Yeah, I mean, I think I think consolidation is obviously uh, vital. I don't think we'll ever see the re return of flicks and breaking right enough. Um, uh, uh, David, you, you're obviously have got real issues in terms of diversity. I mean, obviously the, uh, there's a real issue about geographic diversity. I don't know if you want to comment in, on that. And uh, how do we do actually deliver that diversity? Because diversity comes in many other ways. I mean, you obviously talked to about. Uh, ableism, etc., uh, racism perhaps. I mean, some of the, the high arts companies in Scotland are extremely diverse if you want to look at where the artists come from. I mean, if you look at Scottish Ballet or Scottish Opera, you know, they come from dozens of different uh, countries globally. So how, how, do we, how do we actually look at Im improving that, that situation? I think there's a range of approaches um, probably required. I'll, I'll talk specifically about the ones maybe that link back to your... And, and sorry, just one other thing I should say before I don't want to interrupt you, but just one thing. And how do we encourage people from, say, a deprived background in Scotland to think they can have a future in some of these companies? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll try and pick up uh, on those um, questions as well as uh, adding a little bit to the previous mm -hmm. ones tonight because they, I, th I believe that they are they are related. Um, so in terms of geographic spread, um, in the same way as I believe that strong local uh, arts venues, and I include um, small music venues in that, um, have a range of benefits. <coughs> Excuse me, at various levels within their kind of local city area, if that's Glasgow, for example, um, absolutely believe that, that that same benefit they can function in that same beneficial way as an access point uh, and as part of a strong network, you know, uh, in um, other areas that are currently underserved. Um, and from the point of view of the venues that Glasgow Life are operating on behalf of the city within Glasgow, um, they are to an extent part of a, a national and international network and are very open and willing to work in a way that helps transfer some of the, the value and benefits that, that, that happen through our work um, and coordinate in, a, in, a, in both ways, in, you know, in two directions, uh, with venues uh, maybe in smaller towns and uh, cities around in the country. Um, in terms of uh, specific funds that you uh, a were asking Nick about uh, earlier, I think there is a really strong case um, for specific funds, maybe with a slightly different focus um, than what Nick's talking about, although I also support that. Um, and this is around um, funds being available specifically for venues um, of, of all kinds, um, but particularly smaller ones who tend not to have the internal resource to do it, to make improvements to their um, physical and non-physical uh, structures and processes to address inequality of access. Um, so that can be everything from um, signage that's suitable for people with visual in impairments, and uh, it can be around um, BSL interpretation being much more universally provided for uh, deaf. It could be around ramps and lifts and, you know, um, changing places, standard uh, toilet facilities. Um, it can be around supported attendances uh, or different programming at different times so that um, perhaps people who are, who are neurodiverse can enjoy and engage more uh, with, with art forms currently. There are a range of things that for smaller organisations and venues, um, although it's fair to say they lack the resource to, to spend that money, it, 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 it seems to me to be really important that that money somehow is found because these are very, very real um, barriers um, that act um, to exclude l large groups of people from uh, accessing arts. And that is one of the ways um, in which it, we can improve diversity. Um, the other thing is to bear in mind that this applies equally to performers and artists as it does to audiences. Um, there are still challenges even in some of the venues who are which are quite accessible in many ways to audiences where actually if the performers or artists themselves uh, are disabled in any way or have any other challenges that require 
um, support um, that that actually we're still a long way off that being universally provided um, sort of back of house if you like and it's the same in terms of space to make and develop work and um, that all acts to fill filter out obviously and excludes um, certain people from um, from participating fully in the in, in, in the benefits that arts has to offer okay. thank you thanks thank you Katina. very much Alexander thank you David you, you talk about the the short termism of Creative Scotland in its three year cycle uh, you also then come on to the idea of uh, that there's a perception that's still very biased towards Edinburgh and uh, and national institutions and and we've discussed that already about the funding process that we find ourselves in today so what do you think that the Scottish government in Creative Scotland should be doing differently uh, to try and support uh, the creative industry because we heard from the earlier panel that it can be something as basic as the lack of public transport that stops people going to locations from being able to uh, be supportive of uh, a group, an organisation, an institution, because they're not able to get that uh, ability to, to even travel to the location. Far less about the f uh, affordability of actually going and using the venues. Uh, so, so what do you think the government should be doing different, or what do you think Creative Scotland should be doing to try and manage that situation? Because you've highlighted today some really very interesting and quite important aspects about what's wrong with the industry. So I think that um, it's fair to say that, well, firstly, just to just to mention um, th the evidence that Glasgow Life submitted was as much a collation of views that we hear, um, so much as it's necessarily, um, well, I, I don't think there's anything there I disagree with, but it, but, but it's an attempt to represent the, the kind of uh, quite diverse sector that we engage with and, and, and work with. Um, the, the sector is, is, is diverse in, in, in some ways and can speak for itself in, in, in other ways, but that's it, it's an attempt to do that. However, um, I think that we welcome the huge efforts Creative Scotland are currently making to review uh, how, how they work. Um, it seems to be a really deep and meaningful process of review that's going on, and we have had opportunities to feed into that, which we're, we're grateful for and, and welcome, uh, and are confident that that, you know, that, may, that may lead to a sort of optimization of it of, of, of how they work and um, because it's a it's a hugely important uh, body uh, and and works well in, in many ways does function well in many ways although you're right when you ask people about uh, anything to do with the cultural sector it will be the problems that you'll hear about um, more than anything and that's maybe wor worth noting um I think that there is some scope in looking um at how that national body works with city and local authority mm -hmm. partners over the long term um, there are there is a network of venues some are under threat uh, in some sectors as nick has pointed out and some others are, are under threat and um, the network in some places is is fragile but it, it does exist and it can be strengthened and um, it may be that there will always be a case for very short term, quite short term types of funding because they're appropriate for different types of projects and programmes. But I think it might be worth, um, I think there would be some merit in consideration of the idea that there is a, if you like, um, key series of partnerships with a geographical spread uh, with sort of anchor, anchor points in significant locally based organisations um, that could work with a national body um, to in sh to, to help, well, in fact, to each do what it's most appropriate that, 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 that they do, you know, effectively, and whether or not that funding sort of cascades in a in a slightly different way, um, I think is, is worthy of consideration. And the you know the, the whole idea of partnership collaboration, uh, we've touched on, but we also have, you know there are capacity workers in culture in some locations. There's the art officer that that, that is there to try and support the mechanism to, to ensure that they can engage. Uh, that, that has worked really well in some locations uh, and in other locations it's completely non-existent. Uh, so there's not the comparisons that can be looked at. Uh, so, so how do you think we should be trying to look at that to ensure that we be get the benefit uh, from them all? Um, <clears throat> I have to say that in terms of the whole national picture, I'm very focused on Glasgow, yep. so I'm not necessarily best qualified to to answer. Um, what I can say is that the local authority resource in many cases 
is under pressure um, for various reasons and so the number of those kind of local arts officers who perform that function is in some cases has been reduced or is, is or, or they are very stretched um, so of, there's a you're right there is a question about ensuring that there are there's adequate capacity provided um, on a on a fair and equitable basis across the country um, so that citizens everywhere can can tap into these benefits and, and participate um, and I think that that sort of coordination of provision and a sort of national strategic view is the sort of function that national bodies and government you know can do really well uh, I, I think maybe I'm suggesting there therefore that some of the aspects of delivery um, and connection are, are in turn best carried out at local level. And Nick, do you, what do you, are your views on what should change within the government and the cultural side of things to try and support what you're trying to achieve? Well, on, on the idea of local authorities uh, talking to grassroots music venues, there are currently almost no conversations in Scotland on those lines. So um, if there are funds, then it would be great to see some kind of uh, outreach to the venues and see how those conversations could start. Mm -hmm. um, okay. If their funds are being created, yep. and yeah. say you're in a city like Edinburgh, which has got 20 or so GMVs, um, or less, less recently, um, then it doesn't take much for the appropriate no. person to pick up the phone and start the conversations, bring people in, and really see if they're using their funds to target exactly what the funds are invented for. Because, you know, there's a, there's a knock-on benefit for you all uh, if there is that dialogue uh, to support you, uh, to ensure that you can... Because it's a, a cultural tourism, it, it, it expands across many sectors, uh, so that that opportunity uh, to develop and to expand is there. But if there's no conversation taking place, then there's no dialogue, then there's a real difficulty. Agreed. There's, there's a movement towards um, music cities, mm. uh, which is a bit of a UK thing, but um, it's international as well. Uh, and some of that work has been done in, in Berlin, for instance. Uh, and the idea is that cities should be taking pride in the amount of music provision that they have. Um, but you have to have conversations between uh, local authorities and music groups to have that. Uh, in Edinburgh, we have one such group which is currently slightly dormant, which was set up to try and fix some of the licensing uh, issues that we had around inaudibility, which you, I don't know if you're aware of that campaign. I partly ran that. Um, in Scottish cities, it would be great to have much more conversation between uh, councils and those involved in music provision. I believe in Glasgow, it's increasingly strong. Yeah. Is it strong in Glasgow, David? Sorry. Sorry, I was making notes about something else, and I'm not <laughs> sure exactly I, I what. For instance, Aitken is, is very in favour of. Um, Glasgow being a music city, sure, yes. of uh, exactly. Glasgow's status as a UNESCO yeah, right. city of that. that's, culture. That, that's right. So within, an, a, 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 and this will lead on to a wider point I'd like to make, if I may, um, around what could, could be done or thought mm. of differently. Um, so absolutely, the recognition that um, arts funding is not just about funding the arts. The, in, in terms of looking at it, in terms of what you get back for it, it's a much wider and much more significant uh, issue than that. And yes, one of the very significant things uh, is the economic uh, impact. And the, uh, and within Glasgow's economic uh, planning, the uh, cultural tourism is a is a key driver for the next few years, uh, specifically around uh, contemporary visual art uh, and around music. Uh, Glasgow is a UNESCO um, city of music, um, and also is um, some people have said the unofficial European capital of live music. So the fact that people come to the city because of its cultural scene and in large part its music scene um, definitely seems to hold true <clears throat> and it's something that can be further developed and um, it is a officially a part of the city's tourism and economic uh, development plan. Um, and seeing the arts, music and other um, forms of culture um, in their most diver diverse and vibrant forms as being things that play a huge part in other outcomes is another part of the thinking that I think potentially could be different and to really everyone's benefit. Um, tourism and the economy directly is, is certainly one. Um, the other one is around health and well-being and quality of life into older age, um, attainment in young people, yep. educational benefits, overcoming some of the disadvantages that uh, some of our young people uh, are facing, uh, and people at all life stages. Um, there is um, a, a way to, well, there is increasingly uh, a strong body of evidence that can show the 
benefits in many ways of both participating and being an audience um, for uh, art forms. Um, and this, this can range from increasing uh, language learning and emotional regulation um, and other types of learning in, in primary school age mm -hmm. uh, young people uh, to the proven benefits in reduction and in anxiety and need for medication through people who are experiencing uh, dementia in later life, um, d depression, um, uh, dependence recovery. Um, uh, there are a number of um, S -s significant reports that point these benefits. Um, there was the all-party parliamentary review of the benefits of sort of culture and prescription and art forms that I think came out in 2017, yeah. um, which is, is quite a good summary of the state of evidence uh, currently. But even since then, in the last month, we've seen um, uh, quite a powerful study that took 10 years of museum visit data, analysed it, and sh uh, show even controlling for just the simple benefits of getting out of the house and going and doing something or interacting with some people that was controlled for, and yet they found specifically cultural engagement had additional benefits over and above just those sort of simple factors. And it was all forms of cultural engagement, although the study centred on museum data. And what was fascinating to me about it was that it, only, it was only not true for cinema, mm. and the th working theory seems to be that screen-based passive forms of in cultural engagement are not as effective as any sort of live yeah, cultural yeah. engagement. Um, so. I don't know whether it is um, a, 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 a shift that is possible, mm. but seeing the country and each city within it, and Glasgow obviously has some challenges in this area, seeing the health and social issues that citizens mm. uh, face that I think m most people want, want to try and address, uh, the arts and culture and uh, cultural engagement in various forms can be a huge part of the answer to that and thinking of its funding in the same way or a similar way or related to way how you think of education and health funding i think um has a great deal of merit and i believe that that's something that um that we as an organization are actively engaged in exploring exactly We're time now um Sorry. did you do want to make one last point uh, nick Yes, and it, it, it relates to what's just been said as well, which is that I think for the, for the reasons that David's just uh, expanded upon, um, that is why um, uh, attending, attending cultural events uh, is, is part of the national performance framework. I would say that, uh, I mean, the indicators are the attendance at cultural events or place of culture, participation in cultural activities. So obviously you want to get uh, musicians who are not just, well, musicians and artists, not just at the professional level, but also amateur level and also just keen. Uh, growth in the cultural economy, which we discussed, and people working in the arts and culture. I have to say that grassroots music venues are already very good at achieving these aims. Um, and like many other sets of organisations, we've done so thus far without subsidy. But as I say, now is a very particular time for GMVs to make sure that they continue to do so, uh, to, to provide these things, which do filter into the national performance framework. Um, there will be less from GMVs soon if the right funding is not in okay. place. I think we definitely got that message today. <laughs> Thank you very much to both of you for coming to give evidence to us today and also for your very helpful written submissions as well. Uh, and we shall now move into private session. Thank you. <laughs>